You know, I, I vacillated. I was I, I never had what I'd call a Jerry Jerome style. I I had a style that, of people that I that I aped, that I copied. I lo I loved Lester Young. I heard him when I was with the Reeser Band and and uh, at in um, Kansas City when he was with the eight piece Basie Band. Mm. It was incredible. I was working Fairyland Park uh, Casino, and uh, every night when we finished playing, oh I went down to the, to the Reno Club to mm. hear this eight-piece Basie band that had not even been heard of yet. And it was a, a knocked-out joint. It was incredible. It was just Tell a, us all about it. I can't believe it. There were, you know, people would had like ashtrays and had was smoking marijuana or, or sipping absinthe you know they were there's like a little balcony on and upstairs there was some society women with beautiful hats you know were were just sipping you know this green uh, what absinthe. is absinthe it's it's like it's a alcohol or something? oh it's strong uh, very I mean like, it's it's outlawed now it, it's oh uh, really it's, it contains oil of wormwood and it could uh, well in the absinthe bar in in uh, in New Orleans, the, it wore out the marble. <laughs> so so, so you would, imagine what well, they do to a, to, a, to a stomach. But people used to just sip it and get higher than a, than a kite, you know. So they, uh, it's you know I don't know that it's not sold anymore. I don't, I don't think they're allowed to use it. But anyway, um, I listened to this, to to this band and Lester Young was absolutely the was was paralyzing to me. I'd never heard anything in my life like this man. He was playing a beat up Pan American tenor that had more rubber bands on it than springs, you know, he was, he was not a and he sat he sat with his back up against the chair and just played without moving any other muscle except his hands and his and his mouth. It's incredible. And he sat to, at that time I says he sounds like a French horn. I said, I, I never heard this sound. It sounded like a guy playing jazz French horn with, with, that, with, that, with a little edge to it. I said, I got to play like him. And there's only one way. And I went down there every night and just listened. I was there for, we were there for about 12 weeks. I wish I could plug into your, oh, your ears God. just to, uh, to have heard that because that is such a, a tantalizing thing because that's before Lester recorded. And we oh, all know yeah. that you know, he was... This uh, was before Hammond right. discovered the band, and he he never recorded at that point. And those early records he made about a year later, you know, with Lady Be Good, and yeah. all those were so classic. But just to have heard oh, what he sounded like at that time must have been something else. I wish I Basie mean. had recorded that eight-piece band. Yeah, you well, know? you know, I just spent a few days with Buck Clayton doing an interview out yeah, in New Jersey, Buck and Buck had just joined the band. Right, came at the very end of that thing. Yeah, that's he, right. he took Hot Lips Page's place, that's and he right. says, he says, you never heard anything like that eight-piece band. He says, and as great as the Basie band got, he says, you never heard anything like that eight-piece band. He said it was the Absolutely. swinging thing was, in the world. No charts. It was yeah. all it was all written, you know, like they had worked out their things by by head, I guess, and and played them. But, you know, uh, at when I would, during the time that I was there, when Clayton joined, Lips Page was the master of ceremonies. And you know what the show was? Like after everything else closed in town, they started the show. That would be like four o'clock in the morning. Oh, and so all these fantastic performers would come in like Mary Lou Williams, who, who introduced me to, uh, to Lester, incidentally. I had sat in with, with uh, Mary Lou's, uh, not her band, it was Bus Moton's band, and she played piano with him. And I sat in with them and she took me. She said, you, you sat in with, with, with Bus Moton's oh, band? Oh yeah. Oh, oh my God. Oh yeah. And went over to hear, to hear uh, Lester. I remember so many mornings, Lauren, walking out at 11 o'clock with a pencil of, of burning light coming down the back of the bandstand when you'd open up like a trap door in the back right. where there <laughs> was an entrance and get out where the temperature would be 105, where you could fry eggs on a Kansas City street. No air conditioning. I'd go home, take a shower, stay wet, just throw myself in the bed and let the the fan uh, right. sort of cool me off with the water on my body, and I fall asleep that way. Yeah. It's incredible, and I wouldn't miss—I wouldn't miss one day. For no, day. it's incredible. Well, we're talking with Jerry Jerome at ten minutes after two o'clock about uh, something that we just lucked into, just talking about Chew Berry, and we wound up talking yeah. about Lester Young. I remember yeah. you had mentioned that to me once at Condon's, and in passing, and at that moment, I said to myself, "I got to get him up on the road. We got to find out more about this." And you know, apropos of what you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. In, in talking about uh, Buck 
every member of that band that I've talked to, like Joe Jones, speaks with such reverence of that eight-piece band, like there was something very special, mm -hmm. very, very special. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the Reno Club. You, you, you gave us a good feeling of, of what it was like. Where, where was it in, in Kansas City? I mean, not what street was it on, but in what part of town was it in, and was it below or was it above or was it on the street level or was it dark or light or did you have to pay to get in or well I may be wrong if, yeah. if, if, if there's a listener and we're talking about 50 years me. ago folks so you know yeah I think it was back. I think it was 17th Street I know it was in the black part of town it was in the black section of town and uh, I know that, that you came in off the street and it had this kind of a cute small balcony uh, above and uh, that uh, had a small stage and that no one danced that I remember that seemed like it was all show it seemed like uh, you know from the, well I'd come in after I finished working so I guess that was like showtime you know and Lips Page was the master of ceremonies did a trumpet number and uh, bass played for dancers that are coming in doing all kinds of things singers that would come in and uh, but then they'd go when they'd play their things with the, they had like Lester, and Bar uh, Jack, Washington. Jack Washington on baritone sax, and uh, Buck, right. Clayton was a, one of the trumpet players, yeah. and you know Page and there's right. the same rhythm right. section, that fantastic band. But uh, what was Lester like in those days? Uh, you mentioned that he'd sit there leaning up against a chair motionless, you know, just, just, just moving his fingers, you know, so he wasn't moving around. Was he holding the horn up in the air like he did in later no, years? No. Uh, he played a, a bit on the side, but not, not like uh, a lot of the, you know, uh, pictures indicated he did. Hmm. Well, I guess it was a bit to a side. I think maybe when he got this, a Selmer sax or something, I don't know what... A I, con, he, he played a con. Con. He, he, well, this was a Pan American. Right. So I'm, I'm I knew he changed, later, right. he changed the horn. So maybe that was more conducive to play that way. I think he wanted to hear himself better. I think he could hear himself this way. <laughs> but uh, um, I do know that was a that was a beat up horn that he was playing, mm. and he played it very very well. And then I I couldn't get over the the style being so different. Yeah. And uh, but he, as a person, he was nice to talk to. He was very very kind to me. You know, uh, um, he accepted the fact that I was another tenor saxophone player, and I asked him questions about his playing, about what he, what his thinking were. And he, he was. Do you remember any, any of those conversations or what he said? I couldn't anything? remember the conversation because, because if, if I did, Lauren, I couldn't, wouldn't be able to translate them. He spoke in such a peculiar way. He, he, he'd make up words and right. very creative words, with that, which I'd have to kind of remember and say, what did he mean by that, and and figure them out. You know, a man that goes around calling Lady D and giving right. people, uh, you, you know, uh, Sweetie, and you know he, you know he would give mm. people different names and would refer to to things in a different way. Louis was that way. Louis Armstrong. I spent many, many a night, you know, being in Louis Louis's company. I spent a whole evening in his company at, at Fred Robbins' house, and I didn't I didn't understand much of what he was saying. <laughs> right. You know, he had a funny way of talking, of explaining things. But sure. It was very cute.